So I think it's time to start talking about what happened to your parents. Okay. Like the truthful version. Okay. 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 What? Because listen, listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us. Okay, and we know the reason why. Okay, you need to tell the truth. There's... Listen, listen. You need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Here at JTL, we take a look at interesting cases that raise some thought-provoking questions. So if you're a curious person and you like true crime, then you've landed in the right spot. Today's case is one of the most brutal that our channel has covered. Chandler Halderson recently stood trial for the murder of both of his parents, amongst other related crimes. The evidence against him was overwhelming. His defense team asked few challenging questions, called no witnesses to the stand, and he never testified on his own behalf. This has left us with a case that on one hand has been thoroughly pieced together by investigators in every detail possible, but on the other, from Chandler himself, no explanations have been offered. Why did he do this? Let's take a look. Bart and Krista Halderson were a normal, happy couple. In 2021, they were living in Windsor, Wisconsin with their youngest son, Chandler. Chandler's older brother, Mitchell, only 18 months his senior, had a house of his own and was engaged to be married. Krista had grown up locally. She studied art history at the University of Madison for a few years before returning closer to home to complete her studies after her father fell ill. After college, Krista worked a series of jobs, mostly in retail, at the Old Mall. At one of these retail gigs, she met the young Bart Halderson. The two were married in July 1994. When their boys were born, they lived in DeForest, Wisconsin, which is in Dane County, and later moved to Plymouth a bit further out. It wasn't until both boys had completed high school that the couple relocated to Windsor back in Dane County. Bart was an accountant and he did well for his family. Krista had been a stay-at-home mom, but had returned to the workforce as a receptionist at a car company in the final years of her life. The couple had nurtured lifelong friendships with old schoolmates and childhood friends, as well as new relationships with neighbors. They were a sociable and well-loved couple. On the morning of Wednesday, July 7th, 2021, just before noon, Bart and Krista Halderson were reported missing to the Dane County Police Department by their youngest son, 23-year-old Chandler. Authorities sent out a missing persons alert and began investigating. Chandler claimed to have last heard from his mother a few days prior via text message. They were staying at their cottage a few hours drive away for the July 4th long weekend. The plan was to attend the holiday parade on the Sunday and return home on either Monday evening or perhaps early Tuesday morning, July 6th. By the morning of the 7th, however, they had not returned. Chandler spoke with a local reporter that same day about his missing parents. Got a text from them on Sunday telling me they were going to White Lake. Okay. I don't know when the text was sent because of reception issues that they would have, and they usually turn their phone off because of pay for roaming. Yeah. Um, they brought, or they were picked up by their friends. Okay. Who I never got the name of, and I, I assumed it was someone I was aware of, like the close neighbors of theirs up the street or um, their best friends down on the east side. So. That's what I assumed. I never really asked any further in it, into it. And so they got picked up and they all went up there by like another couple. Picked up here? Yeah, here at my house. Okay. Before I woke up, they, they had everything packed up. And... Chandler, the concerned son of missing parents, also sets off on a mission around their neighborhood to uncover any video evidence. At neighbors' homes along his street, he stops by to inquire whether any of their bell cams or home security footage could possibly have picked up any traffic, people coming or going from his own home. Is the angle set up to see, he asks? How much of a view do you have? Neighbors assured him that they had already handed over all footage to the police in their investigation. He continued to ask questions. Detectives interviewed Chandler at his parents' home later that night. As part of that interview, he shows them around the house. A few notable observations were made during that visit. First, both of his parents' cars were in the garage. This was explained away by the mystery couple that had picked up the Haldersons in their vehicle for their last minute trip to the cottage that weekend. Second was a missing glass pane on the bifold fireplace door. 
Upon close inspection, small pieces of this glass could still be seen attached to the top and bottom of the door. Chandler explained that he had broken the glass accidentally with one of the dog's toy balls and had injured himself in the process, leaving a small piece of glass still wedged in his foot. Because of this, the police may notice some blood from his foot injury around the house, he says. The next day, the Dane County Sheriff's Department began tracing Chandler's movements from earlier in the week, from the last time that his parents were seen or heard from by anyone but Chandler, which was Thursday, July 1st. Investigators' attention promptly turns to a rural property on Cottage Grove, a hobby farm surrounded by woodland, which was owned by Crescent Lasai, a family member of Chandler's girlfriend, Kat. Why this property? Chandler had been out there for July 4th celebrations with Kat, and then visited again the very next day on his own July 5th. Crescent Lasai, or just Cress, is the girlfriend of Kat's mum. She doesn't know Chandler very well, so she thought it was a bit odd that he would ask to come back out to her home again, on his own, simply to use the pool. But she said fine, yes, and gave him her cell number to reach out in advance. Cress misses Chandler's call, but he just turns up anyway. And when he gets there, he's acting extremely odd. He tells Cress that he is struggling with work. His recent job offer at SpaceX had been revoked, he said, because he cannot relocate to Florida. A recent fall down the stairs had left him in a neck brace and with sporadic, somewhat severe symptoms. He claims memory loss, that he wasn't thinking very clearly, and would get lost easily. He said he may require surgery. Cress observed that he appeared spaced out. He was acting strange, disconnected, and wasn't present. At that point in their chat, he asked to use the pool, drove off from the house in that direction, and was gone for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. During this time, Crest drove down to the pool and Chandler was not there. In fact, the cover to the pool was still on, indicating that he had not been down to use it at all. She finds his car on the far side of the large barn sitting next to the tree line of the woods with the door to the back hatch sitting open. Chandler was not with the car. Crest decides to go swimming herself. Chandler emerged from the tree line sometime later, scratched up from the knees down by the berry bushes in the woods and dirty from his hike. He then jumps in the pool and visibly cleans himself up. Three days later, Crest tells the Dane County police searching her property that she had spotted vultures flying overhead across the woodland. They narrow their search. The day after Chandler reports his parents missing, a human torso is located in the woods of the Cottage Grove property. It was buried under a pile of branches. An autopsy concludes that these remains belong to Bart Halderson and that he died of a homicide. He had been shot with a rifle in the abdominal cavity, which reached his spinal cord. One of the shots fired is a contact wound, meaning that the muzzle of the gun had been placed right on Bart's skin when fired. These shots would have been fatal. That evening, Chandler is brought back in for questioning. He is unaware of the discovery by police earlier in the day. In fact, police would later find that hours before they found the remains, Chandler had been busy conducting searches online for news of any body parts being found in Wisconsin. The symptoms of his recent brain and neck injury quickly surface when he has read his constitutional rights before the interview begins. So obviously we're we're here, we want to talk a little bit about uh, your parents going missing, right, Krista and Bart. Um, before we get started, just because you're up here, okay, so I'm just going to read you your constitutional rights, okay, so this is a Dane County issued card that they give us. Um, so I'll just read them to you right off the card, okay? Uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to consult with a lawyer before questioning and to have a lawyer present with you during questioning. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you at public expense before or during any questioning, if you so wish. If you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present, you have the right to stop the questioning and remain silent at any time you wish and the right to ask for and have a lawyer at any time you wish, including during the questioning. Okay. Do you understand the rights I just read you? I do. Okay. Realizing that you have these rights, are you not willing to answer questions or make a statement? Just a yes, right? Yeah, yes. so, so yes. the, the okay. second one, okay. so I'll just read it again. Realizing that you have these rights, are you now willing to answer questions or make a statement? Oh, uh, I will make a statement. Okay. So you understand them? You're, yeah, you're I, to talk I, I, them. Could I have the card so I could read it? I missed some. Um, I'm sorry. I'm... 
I can read still it. Still having a little bit of problems. The the third one. All right, I'll just I'll read it. We'll just start all over. Yeah. yeah we'll just read them all again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you have the rip. Towards the end of the interview, Chandler asked for a lawyer, and detectives arrested him for providing them with false information regarding the investigation into his parents' disappearance. As detectives walked him out to be booked into jail, Chandler allegedly offered multiple times to tell them everything, and also said that they didn't know the whole story. During the course of the booking questionnaire, Chandler also reportedly said he didn't feel bad about what I did. It is unclear at this point exactly what took place, so with Chandler firmly in custody, the detectives pushed on in their search, hopeful that Chandler's mother, Krista, could still be located. Cress's farm in the surrounding woodland was searched thoroughly over the next four days. The full property consists of nearly 45 acres of land, so it was no small task. Inside an empty fuel tank near the barn, a handful of tools were found tucked inside a hole that had been cut into the side. Cress explained that the hole is there so that those who receive it for recycling can verify that it's empty. She doesn't keep her tools in it. Inside this tank, police find a pair of scissors, a broken saw blade, and pruning shears. All three test positive for blood. Experts would later connect these to Bart's remains from the woods. And our priority is to provide the Halderson family with answers to give them peace and closure throughout this tragic event. We have them in our thoughts and prayers every day. The Dane County Sheriff's Office detectives and investigators will follow every lead provided. The latest lead uncovered a second site with body parts on DNR land near Sauk City. We actually uh, obtained a photo uh, of uh, Chandler being in that general area, which is... The Dane County Sheriff didn't know if those remains were male or female. He's still waiting on the medical examiner's report. At this moment, we are optimistic that Krista is still alive and well, and we will let the evidence from our investigation tell us otherwise. After the second set of remains were located, the charges against Chandler changed to include first-degree intentional homicide. The remains found at the second location would eventually be publicly announced as that of Krista Halderson, thus ending a month-long search that covered five locations. Cress's Cottage Grove Farm, the Halderson home itself where additional remains were found, the pond behind the house, the John Creek landfill, and finally the state-owned woodland near the river. A second set of charges was filed against Chandler, duplicating those that he was facing for the death of his father, now also applied to his mother Krista. Although both parents were confirmed as deceased, the searching of the Halderson property was not over because only parts of the Haldersons had been located. Stephen Grieber, a neighbor and retired investigator and detective with Dane County, lives directly across the street from the Haldersons. On July 1st at about 7 p.m., Stephen was out gardening in front of his house and detected a strong odor. Um, at some point, uh, did you talk to a police officer about something you perhaps noticed or, or remembered from July 1st of 2021? Yes, I did. Well, what caught my attention was while I was there doing that for a period of time, all of a sudden I had uh, could detect a strong odor just of burning wood. And uh, so I thought someone maybe had a fireplace um, or a, I should say a fire pit or something outside going. They're just burning some firewood. But... Um, about five minutes or so later, all of a sudden that odor of burning wood became a distinct um, odor that was more like in the line of uh, um, what I thought someone was um, like barbecuing a large uh, pork, like in one of these large uh, um, barbecue, barbecue um, pits or whatever that can hold a whole pork. Uh, and you have that observation that day. You're not here to say exactly what that smell was, right? Other than it smelled to me like, yeah, it was something burning of, of a meat or fats or something. Stephen was not the only neighbor to catch unsettling activity happening at the Halderson residence. A neighbor situated to the far back of the house across the water had security cameras with a range wide enough to catch the light movement through the windows of the Halderson house. Experts examined the camera footage and they aligned the visible light to the windows in the Halderson home. They want to see if the flickering light was created from the fireplace in the house. What they find is that this camera captures light flickering from the fireplace window for close to five hours throughout the night of July 1st and then again on July 2nd, and finally again on July 6th. 
Throughout this period, they also see the light in the garage turn on and off throughout the night in roughly six minute intervals, as the fireplace can be seen raging despite the summer heat. Why the garage? In the garage sat two cube freezers. Traditionally, according to Kat, these held all kinds of frozen foods, vegetables, dinners, ice cream. But when police obtained a search warrant for the residence, they find that the freezers are curiously empty and very, very clean. The insides are scraped for samples and the drains removed and tested as well. They test positive for blood. And not the kind left by partially defrosted steaks and hamburgers. The lab finds that the samples test conclusively for human blood. This unfortunate discovery explains both the late night lights in the garage and the 20 pounds of ice bags purchased by Chandler at about 8.30 p.m. on the evening of July 1st. Chandler is shown on store security footage carrying the ice with ease and no longer wearing his neck brace. In addition to the freezers, police document the fireplace as they find it. The paint surrounding the opening has bubbled from the excessive heat. Droplets of blood are found on the hearth. It has been cleaned up and staged with fresh logs in the previous week's newspapers situated in the firebox. Beside the table sits a small fan and a measuring tape. Remnants of the burst glass are still visible, and investigators believe they can actually pinpoint the exact time that this glass broke. At about 3 a.m., the light from the fireplace turned very bright and then extinguished very abruptly. The discovery of a tabletop fan next to the fireplace suggests that extra oxygen was being pumped onto the flames in order to produce the level of heat required for Chandler's purposes. It is possible then the investigators believe that at some point the heat from the fireplace became too intense and at 3 a.m. that morning it burst the glass and likely injured Chandler's foot in the process. 7 a.m. on the morning of July 3rd, after a night of intense fires, Chandler is back out shopping. This time he is captured at a fleet farm buying a large tarp. He is also busy messaging back and forth with his girlfriend Kat. They have plans to get together at his place that night. Bring some bags of ice, he says. It might not seem like it at first, but Kat is actually extremely lucky. That night and the following day out at Cress's farm for July 4th celebrations, she suspects nothing of Chandler. He also tries to stay in control and limit any potential suspicions. Instead of staying overnight in the upstairs bedroom at his house as they would normally, Chandler builds a kind of couch fort by pushing the pieces of furniture together. Passing this off as something sort of silly, what he does is ensure that overnight she is unable to get out of bed without waking him up in the process. If she, say, wanted to pop to the freezer for some ice cream. At that time she may not have been suspicious, but she was concerned for the Haldersons. It is strange for Krista in particular to be out of touch with her sons. Krista was in touch with them regularly and asking about their plans. Kat and Krista also kept in regular contact. You texted often with Miss Larson? Yes, I did. Um, positive relationship? A good relationship? Yeah. Did you like her? I did like Miss Halderson a lot. Did you like Mr. Halderson? Yes, I did. Now we're into Tuesday, July 6th. Messages between you and Chandler? Yes. Okay. On... July 6, 2021, around 9, now we're into to Tuesday in the afternoon. What do you say to him? Parents home. Uh, what did that mean to you? Are your parents home? Had you discussed with Chandler, like, where are your parents before this message was sent? Was this a follow-up or was this the first kind of time you were asking? Follow-up. Okay. And was that a, like a verbal conversation where you were asking him where they were? Yes. Okay. What did he, told you, what did he tell you in that verbal conversation? Um, there's poor reception up north and by the cabin, so that's why he had been hearing from them. Okay. So you say parents home. Go ahead and read Chandler's response. Uh, 905? No. What do you say? Text Mitch. Mitch is his brother. Correct. Why do you think you should text Mitch? Um, his parents still weren't home at the time they said they would be, and he wasn't receiving many messages from his um, mother that weekend, and that was highly unusual since she texts quite often. Chandler claims to have had a text from his mother on July 4th. She says she is at the cottage, arrives safely, and plans to go to the parade the next day, Sunday. They plan to be back late Monday, maybe early Tuesday. There are two issues with this message. The first, that the parade traditionally attended by the Heldersons, which Chandler was very familiar with, was not held on Sunday that year, it was on the Saturday. 
By the time that Krista apparently sent this message, she had already missed it. The second issue was the data derived from cell towers transferring the message from Krista to Chandler's phone. The text message did not ping from a tower hours away at their cottage. The transmission data indicated that the cell phone never left the Halderson house. Bart and Krista's cell phones were later found wrapped in towels and tinfoil and tucked inside of shoes buried under other shoes and items inside the house. In the basement of the Halderson house, blood splatters were identified and DNA analysis was undertaken. Metal fragments located on the basement floor were later determined to be from bullets and had Bart's DNA on them. A casing was found as well. It was for a rifle, although no rifle was located in the house. Three magazines were also found inside of a partially built wall. In an area where renovations were clearly taking place, police removed the insulation in the wall to reveal the ammunition tucked away inside. Luminol testing for blood took place in the foyer, the family room where the fireplace sits, the top of the stairs leading to the basement, a bathroom, and in the garage. Multiple samples were found, and when the DNA results were returned, they matched Bart and Krista. Perhaps the most damaging and gruesome evidence was located in the ash trap of the fireplace. In the basement of the house, behind a wooden workbench, then behind a wall of wood paneling and accessible only by dismantling the wall, investigators locate the ashes left in the trap from the fireplace on the main level. They find 230 bone fragments in the trap. 106 of these were substantial enough that the type of bone could be identified. These included skull fragments. From the autopsy on Bart's torso and the physical evidence found in the Halderson's basement, it becomes clear what happened to Bart. What happened to Krista, however, is left somewhat ambiguous. It seems likely that she met the same fate as her husband in the basement with a rifle in the early evening of July 1st, shortly after she returned home from work at about 5.30 p.m. Police ask Chandler for every detail of what he claims they did at home that night. Immediately afterwards, he is arrested. I'm home about 5, 20, 5, 30 that day? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, then 5 o'clock rolled up by and we, mom came home. Um, dinner? What did you guys have Wednesday night? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Who made it? I think it was probably just stuff from the fridge. Okay. I, don't, I think we all did our own thing again. Sure. By the way, a detective at my house said something's happened, and while we were leaving, people were going inside. Is there a warrant for my house? Should there be? No, I'm just wondering if... Okay. Um, as far as I know, they were at your house and they were going to be there talking to you to ask if you would come up here and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, but um, Officer Haley just like walked pretty mm -hmm. much in to the gate, you know, the gate on the outside. Mm -hmm. She just kind of walked in. I was, I was wondering if... Was that when wallet. you were getting your wallet? Uh, no, we were, we were, um, I was in the car waiting to leave. I was just wondering everything's okay because okay. she said something's happened okay and we need to go down all right we'll find out what that's about well has anything bad happened oh I'm not sure In October 2021, Crest decides to finally tackle a messy task that she had put off for years, cleaning out and organizing her barn. There is a collection of old boards resting up against the wall on one side of the barn, slightly concealed but partially visible resting in amongst these boards is a large rifle. At first she thinks it could be one of her father's old guns, but she doesn't recognize it. She checks quickly with her elderly father about it. He doesn't think it's his, but he's getting on in age and is a bit unsure. Erring on the side of caution, she calls it into the police. Yep, that's the, the messy, messy shed. 70. There's an item here along the back wall, kind of by some boards. Um, yeah, there's, the, there's a bird bath there. Can you tell at all from this angle what was behind the bird bath? Um, well, there's a rifle there. The rifle matches the bullet fragments and casings found in the Halterson basement. Its presence in Cress's barn appears to have been missed by police in their initial searches of the vast property back in July. Already located on the property is the tarp Chandler was captured purchasing. It has his shoe print on it. 
these same shoes tested positive for his parents' blood. Inside the barn is a plastic bag full of stained rags. The rags also test positive for Bart and Krista's DNA. The rifle was tied back to Chandler as well, not officially through the proper paperwork, but the friend who had gifted it to him, Andrew Smith, had nonetheless documented the transfer in ownership by taking a photo of Chandler's driver's license next to the serial number of the rifle. So I'm showing first this one. This is Chandler's ID, and then you put it up next to that serial number. Yes, sir. Had Chandler asked you for this gun, or was this just your idea? I think he had, at one point, asked for it as a joke, but mostly it was my idea, sir. Okay. Um, you brought him other things that go with the gun? Yes, sir. What type of things? So I had brought him a steel canister that had contained roughly 480 rounds of 762 by 39 steel case tool ammo. And is that the ammunition that goes with that weapon? Yes, sir. Chandler and Andrew had met online and regularly played video games together. Andrew, formerly of the US military, had been stationed in Germany and played online in the evenings. Due to the time difference, Chandler was playing with him for hours during the day when others in his life believed he was working or studying. According to friends and family, Chandler had worked for American Family Insurance, he was a rescue scuba diver with the police department, he had a job pending with Elon Musk's SpaceX in Florida, and he was attending technical college, MATC, for an IT degree due to graduate next semester. There was no job at American Family. Chandler was never a rescue scuba diver with the police, despite missing time he could have spent with Kat because he claimed to be on call with them and couldn't get together. The job with SpaceX in Florida never existed. At trial, the prosecution argued that Chandler's fall down the stairs and subsequent neck brace were an excuse to get out of the SpaceX Florida lie, one that was no longer needed once his parents were no longer around to question him about it. Now around this time, Chandler started telling people an extraordinarily bizarre set of claims. That he had a brain bleed, a hematoma, that he had spinal damage, that he needed his head drilled open, that the inability to use his legs at all. Couldn't drive, people had to do that for him that he had nerve damage, that he needed to get a colostomy bag. But most importantly, he couldn't go to Florida. The doctors had told him he couldn't fly. Of course, that's not true. But he was also due to graduate with a college degree in only months, and he had not been attending courses at MATC for years. It was this elaborate charade that was unraveling in the days leading up to his parents' deaths, and it's the closest explanation that has been offered for why Chandler was motivated to murder his parents. Chandler had created false identities for individuals that worked in HR at Family Insurance and false identities for representatives that worked at the college. He set up Gmail accounts for them and even went so far as to buy a burner phone and use the number as a contact for the school, posing as a college official when his father called the number. When I talked to the advisor, he sounds just like Chaz on the phone. Now this kept going. The lie about going to MATC or Madison College was the most extensive. There were emails, dozens if not hundreds of emails going back and forth between supposed advisors at MATC and Chandler and then he'd forward them to his dad from people like someone named Alyssa Brandt, 64. Sometimes Chandler would spell Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T, sometimes just with a T and no D, depended on the day. But they all had the at Gmail address not at madisoncollege.edu. And you'll hear from the people at Madison College, their people have real emails, they don't use Gmail. Bart Halderson, just before his murder, talked to a man named Omar Job. Omar Job is a entry level customer service guy at MATC, he's got no skin in the game, doesn't even really remember the call, but it was recorded for customer service purposes. Hi. Um I'm trying to get an appointment scheduled to meet with somebody um, to mainly just get a copy of a transcript and also a printed copy of a certificate that was earned and, and uh, you know, other degree verification. Do you know, do you have a, uh, an Alyssa Brandt that works in uh, that area or anywhere in the campus? Uh, what is the last name? B R A N. I think it's T or D T. 
Let me say the first name is Alyssa. Alyssa? Yeah, A L Y S S A. No. Uh, all the bands. Today's no Alyssa. And when you look at Bart Halderson's work calendar that he maintains at his accounting firm, you see something quite interesting. Remember at the beginning, I said I wanted you to remember a date, a time, which was that the Haldersons were killed between 3 and 5 p.m. on J July 1st, 2021. Guess what was on Bart's calendar at that exact time? He was supposed to have a meeting with the people at MATC with his son. Chandler's defense team claimed that the college lie could not be a motive for murder because Bart and Krista had been reading these emails for months. They were intelligent, college-educated people who must have known, must have known, that this correspondence was fake and that their son was a liar. There was no reason to believe that Chandler would meet with any harsh repercussions from his parents for his actions and therefore there was no reason to kill them. Chandler was a liar, they said, but does that make him a murderer? Minutes before the scheduled meeting with the college, Bart messaged his son, ready when you are, but Bart never leaves for the meeting. A short while later, Chandler texts his mother and tells her to message him instead of his dad if she needs to. Bart's phone is dead, he says. Then he asks her to stop and pick up some soda on her way home from work. Krista happily agrees. Her last message to her son ends in a smiley face. She returns home shortly after 5 p.m. with the soda. She is caught by security cameras coming home, but just like her husband, never shown leaving. It took the jury less than three hours to find Chandler guilty on all counts for both of his parents, from providing false information about a missing person to committing murder. His homicide convictions should carry a life sentence. That hearing is scheduled for mid-March 2022. Thanks once again for joining me here today. My name is Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.